Coming up tonight on America's Hope, Iran unleashes a barrage of missiles and rocket fire upon Israel. The question is, what will Israel do to respond? And do not forget that hostages are still being held by Hamas in Gaza. What's being done for them? That and more is our focus on Israel tonight. Good evening from New York, I'm Kelly Wright, and this is America's Hope. We're glad that you could join us this hour. We're focusing on Israel. In the aftermath of Iran unleashing a barrage of missiles and projectiles over the weekend over Israeli airspace, something's quite clear. Israel now faces more challenges to its national security. And how does that impact the rest of the world? We'll be talking about this tonight with Sharon Haskell of the Knesset and Yigal Karamon of Memory. That's the Middle East Media Research Institute. We'll be talking about possible action Israel may take in response to the Iranian attack. Plus, let us not forget, there are still hostages being held in Hamas captivity in Gaza. So tonight, we'll also be talking to family members of hostages about their hope to see their loved ones returned home soon. I recently traveled to Israel to speak with those family members plus to reach out to find out if there's hope for Israel. That's our subject tonight, focus on Israel. Let's get started. My first guest tonight is a member of the Knesset. Sharon Haskell joins us from Israel, and she, of course, is someone very acquainted and familiar with how the Knesset is perhaps responding to Iran, if there is a response in order. Uh, Sharon, thank you for joining us this hour. Will Israel respond to Iran's uh, attack? Oh, we reserve the right for the response. Um, look, Iran has declared war. This is a sovereign country who's actually attacking another sovereign country. And just to remind you, Kelly, um, this is after years and years of them threatening Israel uh, uh, in, in so many speech, speeches uh, where, uh, where they say they call for the complete annihilation of the state of Israel. So, I, I mean, this would have came sooner or later. And so I think that our response has to be strategic. What we've seen on this weekend you know, it's only the, uh, the like the uh, the tip of the iceberg of what uh, of the iceberg of what can actually happen. If any other country in Europe or you know in the Middle East would have been attacked that way, the results would have been devastating. And so we have to make sure that Iran doesn't have these capability. And just try to imagine if they would have nuclear capability, would they hold back? Probably not. And so that has to be on focus, our mission, to make sure that this, uh, uh, you know, th this, uh, uh, this crazy regime, who's the biggest instigator of terror, the biggest um, destable, uh, uh, you know, uh, destabler in the Middle East, is, uh, you know, is, is not threatening our day-to-day -day life and our stability here in the region. Even going back to October 7th, uh, 2023, with the attack by Hamas, which uh, of course was was pushed forward and, and the idea hatched by the Iranians. So with this happening now, it's, it's, it's really clear that Iran's no longer operating through its proxies, but as you've stated, making a direct attack on Israel, attacking, we should point out, the little Satan and holding in reserve to attack the big Satan, which would be America. Absolutely, and that's why it's a common interest. I mean, what we've seen, the operation uh, to intercept, and we intercepted 99% of those missiles and drones and UAVs, um, that was a collaboration, uh, you know, of America with Israel, with the, uh, uh, the UK, with Saudi, with Jordan, and with Egypt as well. And you know what? That actually gives me hope. It gives me hope that cooperation and partnership here in the Middle East is something that can actually wor work uh, when we try to defend our communities. And if I can use, Kelly, please, this opportunity to thank the American government and the American people for the love, uh, the prayers, 
and the support that we receive from you. You cannot imagine how much strength it actually gives us to know what an incredible friend we had that stand, stand by us. Do you still hold to that, that, that truism that you've talked about? Absolutely. Look, Iran is on this race. Uh, uh, and, 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 and as the biggest force in the Middle East, of, uh, you know, they're, they're the biggest instigator of terror. They're, they're the biggest funder of terror. You know, what they have in Yemen, Lebanon, Syria, Iraq, um, these are battalions, armies of Iran that are sitting on our borders and are attacking us on a daily basis. But look what the Houthis are doing. They're doing that on the Iranian order to attack commercial ships. I mean, American troops has had lost their lives fighting uh, against Iran, which are, you know, the Houthis are only their proxies. And so, you know, w when you look on what's happening here, this is just the start. They are stretching the red lines. And if we don't give a straight answer to Iran, they'll continue to push the lines. Why did they instigate the 7th of October attack? I mean, they funded it. They planned it. They uh, paid for it. They built those uh, vicious, horrifying weapons and shipped them into Gaza and into Lebanon to try and make as much destruction, uh, destruction as possible. Why did they do that? The first reason was the closer connection that was forming between Israel, Saudi, and the Americans. Okay, that triangle got them so much uh, to fear that they instigated one of the most horrific attack that you can ever imagine. I mean, this is every mother worst nightmare that actually came true. And, and, and so, you know, when they are stretching those red lines, the world needs to understand we are just the front line. If Israel fall, the next one is America. The next one would be Europe. They will not hold back. You know, I've talked about uh, that day, October 7th, and where you were and and how it hit you, um, especially being a former member of the Israeli Defense Force. Um, take me back to that day, October 7th, and, and how you reacted once you realized what was unfolding. Wow. Um, I just felt completely helpless. I mean, I was a combat soldier during the time of the Second Intifada. I see videos, I mean, live Facebook that are coming up, you know, on, on friends and families' uh, 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 social media accounts on how their family members are being murdered in the most brutal ways. I mean, you cannot imagine the, 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 that, that kind of helpless sense. And to me, it really feels like you know, we failed our grandparents. Our grandparents have been through the most horrific persecution that you can ever imagine, and they survived it. They survived it so that, you know, their grandkids will have a shelter, will have a safe place without anti-Semitism, a place where we can defend ourselves by ourselves, that we're not at the mercy of any kind of ruler or, or government, and we're capable of defending our own children for the first time in centuries and and for me it really feels like a big failure I mean many of them are not alive anymore and in a, in a sense I'm, I'm grateful for that because I have no it would have completely completely destroyed them to actually see a, a, a genocide you know such a massacre in the most horrific ways babies being burnt little girls being raped in front of their parents I mean I cannot explain to you that feeling and that uh, I will carry for the rest of my life. You're a member of the Knesset and from a government standpoint, what, do, what does the Israeli government have to do in order to deal with Hamas, deal with the adversaries that you have, including Iran? And then there's Russia and then the, the nexus of, uh, of terror even coming from the CCP. What do you have to do, even if you have to do it alone? Wow. 
Well, I think that the first thing that we have to do is complete our work in Gaza, which means to bring back more than 130 family members that are being held in the dungeons of Hamas, tortured, abused, physically, mentally, sexually, being starved. Uh, that is our mission to bring them back. And so we have to finish the operation. We have to enter Rafah and we have to reach the Philadelphia crossing and hold it because that's the main point of Hamas on their uh, money income and also the the importation of weapons, the smuggling of weapons. And so we have to complete it to make sure that something like the 7th of October will never happen again. We cannot border an ISIS organization. So right now with everything that had happened on the weekend, we have to make sure that we complete the job in Gaza. Then after Gaza, we have to confront our northern front. And that's Iran and that's Hezbollah. And it's gonna take time. And 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 trust me, I mean Kelly, we do not want to see Beirut in Beirut, the images like in Jabalia or Khan Yunus, but they have left us no other choice. Uh, I mean, it's been more than six months that the international community had a chance to try and find a diplomatic way. Hezbollah is not a tur. It's not going back. We have tens of thousands of people who have evacuated, who have been displaced from their homes. You know, every single day we have rockets being shot from Hezbollah into our homes, into our cities, into our towns. And so there is going to be a point where we are going to have to confront it. And unfortunately, if the international community is not going to address that now, this is going to be another confrontation we're going to have to deal with as soon as we finish with Hamas. And then we have to deal with Iran. (laughs) And and in Iran, it has to be together. It's a very difficult place that Israel finds itself. And then, of course, you are very much aware of uh, the pro-Palestinian movement and and uh, basically criticizing Israel, saying that uh, uh, that Israel is not being sensitive to the humanitarian crisis that's unfolding uh, in Gaza in in, in, re- in response to the retaliatory strikes that Israel has conducted in order to root out Hamas. Talk to me about that. Uh, the critics that have lined up against Israel. What do you say to them? You know, it's just, it's just mind blowing on how they're like, uh, I cannot understand that. And I think that those people need to do an internal account with themselves. Look around, who are you supporting? You're supporting Hamas, A, 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 a terrorist organization who has committed the most horrifying crimes against humanity. Who are you standing with? Iran? I mean, look around the world. Who's marching hand in hand with the Jewish community? It's Christians and the Iranian refugees. Okay? Why do they do that? Because they understand what the uh, the Islamic Republic of Iran, the Ayatollahs, are capable of. They massacred them. They butchered them. They stripped them from every single right and liberty that they had. And they were able to escape. And where are they marching now? with the Jews against Iran. Who are you surrounding yourself with? Radical Islamists who, as soon as you would step into their towns, they would butcher you. I mean, look on the LGBTQ community, and that is unbelievable. They have queers in in, in the LGBT communities for Palestine. Do you know they're hanging them, throwing them out of rooftops? Those Palestinians from the LGBTQ community find refuge. They're actually refugees in Israel with Israelis' organization. I mean, has the world gone absolutely mad? What are you supporting? Radical Islam that is trying to take over your world, to take your liberty, your freedom, your identity, to force you into this religion of darkness. I mean, I just cannot understand that. The only thing is that it has become so fashionable that people completely ignore the facts and the history and the geography and the culture. And 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 I think that parents have to sit down with their kids and educate them 
educate about the values, educate about the history, educate about the geography, and yes, also about religion and what it actually means to lose your liberties because someone have fought so that you have those liberties on a silver platter. So many people lost their life in the attempt to defend and receive those liberties and the freedom that you can exercise. And I think that it is such an important lesson to learn that it doesn't come for free. It has such a heavy price. And we know that. We know that because we have to fight for our freedom and our liberty every single day. And you're doing that. And, and many people would say, why do you stay? And, and I recall talking to uh, some Holocaust survivors when I was there recently. And they said to me, where else can you go Jewish and feel safe other than Israel? And, and let's, let's be clear, uh, Sharon, as you pointed out to me, that the attack on October 7th was designed to annihilate Jews, but it also included moderate Muslims as well as Christians. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I mean, they didn't look on, 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 only on the Jews. They saw a woman with hijab and they shot her. They murdered her. They took foreign workers, Thai, Filipino, Nepalese, Indians, and, and massacred them, uh, abused their bodies in the most horrific ways. They don't care for, for, for anything. And, and you know what? It's not that they just don't care for the lives of Israelis and, and, and Israelis, Arab, and Jews, and, 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 and Christians, and, and foreigners. They don't care for the lives of their communities and Palestinian either. I mean, they, Hamas is holding them captive and use them as human shield. They use children as human shield. The bigger the disaster, the, the more people uh, uh, are dead, you know, the better it is for them. The more they're profiting. They're literally, I, I mean, when we open the corridor, the humanitarian corridor for Palestinians to actually move, Hamas snipers shot them dead on the road. So they don't care for them. They don't care. They don't value the value of life. And that's the idea of radical Islam, that your death is more glory and more honor than anything else. And you don't care for that. You don't care for the life of your children. And when we say that, you know, there'll be peace when they love their children more than they hate us, mm. that's what it actually means. So I really appreciate you coming on. I know that you love Israel. You, you love uh, America. What's your hope for Israel? Well, uh, first of all, thank you so much for inviting me to your show. And thank you so much for covering, you know, the, the whole situation that we're in at the moment. Um, and I, I really hope that right now we sit down and we start planning for in, that in two or three generations, maybe we'll be able to live side by side. We have to start talking on how to de-radicalize the Gazan population, the Palestinian population. And I believe it starts with education. And with education, it's a process. It's not going to happen tomorrow. But maybe in two, three generations, there'll be Palestinian people who will be willing to live side by side with us and not chant to the elimination of our nation and to genocide our people.